very good evening from Chennai. There are very few topics or areas of clinical, modern clinical medicine in which the emphasis on preventive medicine is more than that of curative. And this we have learned the hard way. So it gives me great pleasure to present one such topic, which is prevention of embolism, prevention of thromboembolism. So venous thromboembolism prophylaxis, focusing on the post-surgical period and mainly in the elderly and the obese groups of patients. And this would be a significant uh, case load for most of the big hospitals. And we will spend the next 15 minutes analyzing this aspect. So deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, collectively termed as VTE, they form a significant disease burden. As given out by graphic for public consumption by the CDC, we find close to a million cases every year and close to $10 billion in cost to the taxpaying public. So modern medicine has got a major responsibility towards this, more so when we come back to our topic, which is more than 50% of the blood clots which we see in patients are due to hospitalization. Now, hospitalization because of medical or for surgical reasons, but we will focus on the latter. As many as 70% of cases of hospital-associated VTE are preventable through prevention measures, and we're going to spend the next few minutes looking at that. Sadly, fewer than half of the hospital, hospitalized patients receive these measures, and that's a major area of focus for us. So this has been identified many years back, but the different societies have tried to put in exhaustive guidelines Starting with 2012, the American College of Church Physicians came out with elaborate guidelines. And 2017, the European Society, the NICE guidelines from UK in 2018, and the American Society of Hematology guidelines in 2019, which have been uh, further elaborative for cancer and subset of patients in 2021. So keeping this in mind, the first aspect or step would be to do risk assessment, since cost versus benefit has to be balanced. So which of these patients would be categorized as moderate or high risk and they would demand more of our attention. So the Padua BTE risk assessment model for medical patients, wherein we see among the different factors, age more than 70 and obesity. So that brings us back to focus of this particular talk. And we find that this model correlates pretty well in the medical patients. The Caprini's risk assessment model is used for the surgical patients. It's quite exhaustive and I will not go into the details, but what would suffice is that we need to place or find out or categorize the patients, whether they are low, moderate or high risk and accordingly institute preventative measures, either mechanical or pharmacological prophylaxis. So what are these prophylaxis methods? Just a quick snapshot, mechanical prophylaxis methods, simplest being walking or ambulation, then we have IPCs or the intermittent pneumatic compression devices or the sequential compression devices. We have graduated com compression stockings, also called TED or anti-embolism stockings. IVC filters, pretty much in vogue a few years earlier, but now recommend, not recommended by any of the societies, mainly because of the risks and the complications which far outweigh the benefits. Pharmacological methods, Still, the backbone of therapy is heparin-based molecules, unfractionated as well as no molecular weight, and the synthetic fondaparinic sodium. Aspirin and direct-acting uh, anticoagulants are also coming into play in a big way because of the compliance and the long duration of post-operative prophylaxis that we would see subsequently, and the cost aspect. So extended prophylaxis versus short-term prophylaxis, wherein the focus would be on more than three weeks of prophylaxis after the surgery and institute them as early as possible. Different hospitals and healthcare systems have instituted algorithms. One such is this, wherein major VT risk factors need to be identified, presence of cancer, previous VT, and more importantly, the contraindications, the high risk of bleeding, whether the patient is already systemically anticoagulated and a high INR. These would need to be balanced when we institute prophylactic venous thromboembolism measures and low molecular weight happens being the main molecule. We need to look at the renal clearance of these patients in order to titrate the guideline, titrate the dosage. The NICE guidelines or the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, the UK based guidelines have identified hospital associated thrombosis as 
those occurring within 90 days of hospital admission. And that's the reason the focus is on starting profile access within 14 hours of admission and also stress on reassessing these patients continually in order to understand that there's a very thin line between bleeding and prevention of thromboembolism. The emphasis on early mobilization and good hydration, going back to the classic virtuous triad, wherein stasis needs to be prevented and the viscosity of blood plays a factor. So pharmacological versus mechanical prophylaxis method needs to be balanced. So coming to the ASH or the American Society of Hematology 2019 guidelines, it talks about the fact that surgery accounts for around 25% of VTEs and the highest risk is the arthroplasty group with followed by neurosurgical and vascular procedures. Postoperative VT historically always been seen in the context of happening after the patient gets discharged. Sorry, uh, while the patient is still in hospital. But we see the converse happening in modern day medicine wherein ambulatory surgeries have become the norm. And hence we see that most of the time this would happen when the patient is at home a few days after being discharged. So the focus is on not just short term, but on extended thromboprophylaxis going anywhere between from three weeks to six weeks. The ASH also came up with cohort based guidelines, which would be sort of helpful in uh, di uh, different healthcare institutions, which focus on specific surgical methods. We have trauma centers, we have laparoscopic centers, and so on, or neurosurgical centers. So we have a healthy mix of guidelines which talks about using the mechanical as well as the pharmacological prophylaxis methods in different combinations, sometimes in tandem, sometimes one followed by the other. A general schema would be something like this, where in general and abdominal pelvic surgery patients could be identified or placed in categories based on the Caprini score as low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. And then they would be started on mechanical methods like intermittent pneumatic compression. And then subsequently, depending on the risk stratification, they would receive pharmacological thromboprophylaxis with anoxaparin 40 milligrams subcute daily, continued for at least 10 days. The newer guidelines of 2021 talk about cancer patients in which the higher bleeding versus lower bleeding risk has to be balanced. The higher the risk of bleeding, we come down, uh, reduce the pharmacological methods and use mechanical methods. The emphasis has been on postoperative thromboprophylaxis and not to discontinue these at the time of hospital discharge, instead continue up for up to four weeks post-op. So this is a general schema. When we find patients with cancer are never low or moderate, they're always high risk and they always need to receive both mechanical and pharmacological prophylaxis extending up to four weeks after surgery. Arthroplasty, hip and knee arthroplasties have always traditionally been mostly most studied groups and most of the meta-analysis would actually include these patients. And the uh, different societies have come out with more specific guidelines pertaining to these as we see over here that aspirin and direct acting uh, oral anticoagulants also figure in the prophylactic guidelines since they are most cost effective and they need to be continued for at least 28 days especially in hip arthroplasty where the risk of uh, thromboembolism is quite high. If you look at the non-major orthopedic procedures there it comes that some of the arthrotomies and smaller procedures, osteotomies, they carry a low VT risk, not, however, when the patients are older and the BMI is higher. So this bring us, brings us to the specific groups which you're talking about, and this has been elucidated in the European Journal of Anesthesiology, the ESA guidelines, which talks that none of the current recommendations are dedicated only for the elderly, since the elderly also have a higher bleeding risk and limited physiological reserves we find that age over 70 is a very definitive risk factor for post-op PT. Added to that, the issue of frailty. So we need to categorize them into strong, moderate, and weak risk factors. And then we see that this guideline offers specific instructions on patients who are also getting hormone replacement therapy. So what are the recommendations? We extrapolate these from the non-age specific trials and the recommendations to use multimodal interventions as early as possible, institute them, and look for the comorbidities which would worsen the outcome. So CCF, obesity, renal failure, arthritis, the list goes on. A glimmer of hope is that statins and direct acting oral anticoagulants are being studied for prophylaxis. And hopefully a few years down the line, we would have definitive guidelines based on them. But till then, till then we are now stuck with low molecular weight heparin. And we should be careful in respect with respect to the renal creatinine clearance when we use them. So, Fragility factors, 
uh, fragility fractures in the elderly and we look at the different risk factors and the nice guidelines recommend using a low molecule weight heparin at least for one month postoperatively in the obese again we have a major guidelines by the european society of anesthesiology the higher risk of vt is is not just because of obesity but also due to the other associated risk factors and if we go back to virtual stride we see that there is a prothrombotic tendency because of enhanced platelet activity impaired fibrinolysis and activation of endothelial cells so the recommendations are obese patients with higher risk we need to look into the extent of obesity the presence of other features other comorbids and if feasible we will go for laparoscopic procedures which have a lower risk use definitely mechanical uh, methods of thromboprophylaxis and among the pharmacological methods low molecule weight heparins are the kingpin of management yes there is an issue with obese patients that we cannot have a one size fits all bmi more than 31 going up to 60 and we cannot use the same dose for all of them we need to titrate the doses and use maybe anti 10a assays to find out whether we are on the right track and we need to also continue this thromboprophylaxis for 10 to 15 days now that is a minimum guideline enoxaparin daltaparin tenzaparin all have different manufacturers and different societies give different guidelines but what's important is that we need to use them twice daily and this is not the the therapeutic dose is i'm talking about the prophylactic dose and in the in the obese population we need to use them 40 or 60 mg subcutaneous twice daily more importantly use them for at least 10 to 15 days after surgery fondaparinex is another option which has been offered in the uk based guidelines so quickly going to summarize all this we find elderly over 70s are a definitive risk factor added comorbidities to them heart failure uh, respiratory failure renal failure and cancer so all this put together rolls them and then we come across them as a very high risk population who demand good attention not only because they have limited physiological reserves but they would also have a higher bleeding tendency and we need to balance the risk of bleeding versus that of clotting and embolism so multifaceted interventions are sort of recommended by all the guidelines using mechanical and pharmacological methods and extend them minimum up to 2 weeks or 3 weeks as per the ash guidelines emphasis on early mobilization and adequate hydration obese patients have a higher risk primarily because of the very nature of obesity and the added risk factors vt prophylaxis minimum for 2 weeks post op in obese patients mainly using low molecule weight heparin and dose scaling for the higher bmis guided by different assays so i have been trying to sort of wrap up all the guidelines given by different societies and uh, present them in a nutshell with fair emphasis on the fact that we need to identify the risk factors and treat most of the elderly and the obese among the high as the high risk group for thromboembolism and institute appropriate measures uh, this has been also a factor that i have i come from a cancer institute wherein cancer is always the focal point of management and we we deal with patients who are obese as well as who are in the elderly bracket and this makes it all the more imperative that we watch them very closely monitor the parameters and take decisions on a constant reassessment uh, mechanism wherein the risk of bleeding has to be balanced very closely against our thromboprophylactic methods such that we get together as a clinical multidisciplinary team and institute appropriate mechanical and pharmacological thromboprophylaxis mechanisms so that we reduce the disease burden thank you so much for this